Food Heals Podcast, Episode 22. Thank God those paramedics came up there and used a defibrillator on me and brought me back to life because I almost missed the whole thing. I almost miss all of life. Holistic Voice presents the Food Heals Podcast with your hosts, Alison Melody and Susie Hardy. Join the Food Heals Nation and learn the secrets to go from feeling unwell to healing yourself. Warning, side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, an increase in sexual activity, feelings of joy, cravings for kale and quinoa, and a spike in Tinder matches. In rare cases, women have experienced a strong desire to change their status update from hashtag blessed to hashtag OMG even more blessed than yesterday, hashtag loving life. If you've experienced any of these symptoms, make sure to tweet a Kardashian immediately. All right, welcome, Food Heals Nation. Thanks for joining us. I'm Allison Melody. I'm Susie Hardy, and today is a hashtag TBT throwback episode to an incredible interview from our film, Food Heals. That's right. Last Thursday, you heard part one of my interview with Khalil Rafati, and today we have part two. But first, we've got a new item in our Food Heals celebrity swag bag. Ooh, what is it? So exciting. It's 100% Pure's coffee bean eye cream. Want to try it? Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm put it on right now. So try this. And the cream depuffs. It banishes under eye circles, lessens the lines and wrinkles, and it nourishes with anti-aging nutrients. Oh, my God. And it smells really good. I know. I love we, that smell. Food Heals Nation knows I love smells. Good smells. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I talk about, isn't it? I know. <laughs> but it's so good. So if you want to enter the swag bag contest, you know what to do. Subscribe, rate, and review. Subscribe, rate, rate, and review. It really helps us out when you do that. You can screenshot your review and send it to us on Facebook at Food Heals Nation. Tweet it to us at Food Heals Nation or email it to us at info at foodhealsnation.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by the Global Healing Center. You know who the Global Healing Center is. We talk about them all the all time. The time. <laughs> <laughs> we love their organic products. We love their commitment to being green. And our favorite products are the Parfait Visage Anti-Wrinkle Cream, which I told you makes me look younger. That's okay, right. It does. <laughs> and the Aqua Spirit Spray, my favorite because it smells so good. <laughs> yes. And you got to take that to the beach because it's so refreshing. And the new product I'm trying right now is the Veganzyme Digestive Enzymes, and they're awesome. And you know, it's so important to take a really good digestive enzyme because we just don't have them in our foods nowadays. We're, they're over-processed, they're overcooked. It's so true. And sometimes people have allergies to food and they don't even know it, and they don't even know that all their energy is going to digest their food instead of energy to healing or instead of energy to doing whatever they need to do in the day. That's right. Stay tuned and we'll tell you how to get 20% off Global Healing Center products plus free shipping. You know the coupon code. We've told you before. If you don't, later in the show, we're going to tell you during our interview with Khalil. Khalil Rafati is the owner of Malibu Beach Yoga as well as Sun Life Organics, a series of popular juice and smoothie bars. After many years of drug addiction and severe depression, Khalil discovered juicing, yoga, and meditation. He began to experience miraculous changes in his physical and emotional well-being. It became his personal mission to love, heal, and inspire. Khalil remains a mentor to recovering addicts, and he previously owned and operated Riviera Recovery, a transitional living center. And Khalil is one of the most informative, inspiring, interesting guys that I know. You know, his story is moving. And he's also one of the stars of the film Food Heals, which you can check out the trailer at foodheals.tv. So I hope you enjoy part two of our interview with Khalil. The Food Heals podcast starts now. Can you tell me a little bit about what led to your drug addiction and what was going on during some of those dark days? My, you know, my darkest days... My darkest days did not start in the midst of my addiction. My darkest days started back in my childhood, having two parents that were both immigrants for different, from different countries that spoke different languages, that came from different religions even. Um, I felt pretty ostracized as a child, and it was a pretty tumultuous marriage, to put it lightly. Um, my mother came from Poland, she was in the war. She was abandoned as a child on a doorstep um, and was taken in by a family um, and then eventually uh, into a work camp. And um, sad, you know, really, really sad story. 
and um, and she doesn't talk about it a lot, and I don't talk a lot of, uh, talk about it a lot. But I think it's important. I think it's important to mention um, because a lot of times we have these feelings of shame or pain or not feeling like we belong, and we think that we're the only ones. And um, you know, I definitely felt those feelings. Um, my father came from Palestine, pre-Israel, Palestine. So when he was uh, 12 years old, his father's land, his father's olive orchard, that he had worked um, for the he worked for the British government as a postal clerk, saved up all his money, and he had this olive orchard. And uh, and when my dad was 12 years old, one day there was you know, mortar rockets and mortars and machine gun sounds and they ran up into the hills and, you know, they they came back down and uh, that was no longer their land. Um, and then they, they, you know, they lived, I don't know, like refugees. And uh, um, I've got a lot of mixed feelings about that uh, because my mother by birth, I, b I believe, is a Jew. Um, but she was taken in by a Catholic family, and my father by birth is a Muslim. And um, I don't know, it's almost like when I talk about it, like no wonder I was on drugs. <laughs> you know, I mean, what, what, uh, what else was I going to do with all of that inner turmoil? And, um, and I have to laugh at it because it's really sad. It's really, really sad for a little boy to grow up in a little town in Ohio where I'm going to say everybody, obviously not everybody, but it seemed as if everybody was like mom, dad, dog, cat, dinner at six, everyone looked like the Brady Bunch or leave it to Beaver, and then there was our house, you know. Kids weren't allowed to stay the night at my house. I wasn't allowed to stay the night at kids' houses. Um, that's fucking tough as a kid when you're not allowed to play, you know, with your neighbor um, because of, you know, whatever prejudices were going on at that time. It was a real tough childhood. And uh, because I felt so ostracized and so alone, I began to act out. And when I began to act out, then I was told in my Catholic Jesuit St. Patrick's of Heatherdown's upbringing that I was bad and that I was no good. And I was made to eat in the janitor's room. I had to eat my lunch in the janitor's room because they didn't want me playing with other kids. I felt alone and I felt like I didn't belong and so I acted out and as I acted out I was told that I was bad and then I was told that I was bad so I acted out and then it sort of became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, when you're a kid and, and you, you, you can't express yourself um, then um, you know I guess sometimes you act out and, and I did and, and, and you know I'm not saying that those teachers or principals or whatever were like these horrible, evil people. I was a bad kid. Or I was a sad kid acting bad because I didn't know what else to do with myself. Um, and, uh, you know, it just snowballed. I, I ended up getting kicked out of that grade school, um, going to a public junior high, almost got kicked out of there my third day in. Um, then eventually went to a private high school, got kicked out of there, tried going to another private high school. They wouldn't accept me. Went to a public high school and ended up dropping out um, my senior year. And again, you know, I presented well. You know, I could uh, dress cool or, or get a pretty girlfriend or whatever, but inside I was dying. And, um, and, the, and drugs and alcohol in the beginning entered my life um, almost as, as, a, as a place to belong, you know. The older kids in the neighborhood were smoking pot and drinking. My mother worked nights. They would come over when my mom would leave. My dad left, you know, many, many years before that. Um, so uh, drugs and alcohol entered as sort of like an initiation and a place to belong. It was almost like my own little club. I got to hang out with the old kids and act cool. Um, eventually, selling drugs, doing drugs kind of became a way of life. And um, eventually, it, they just get a hold of you. Um, they just get a hold of you. Now, couple that with really super long winters, lack of sunlight, lack of exercise, massive amounts of mercury fillings in my teeth, seeping that poison into my bloodstream, poor diet. You know, it's Ohio. I mean, I just got back from there. And like, people aren't all obese and overweight in Ohio because they're, 
they're bad people. That's just, that's what everyone does. If, if we all ate Doritos every day and ate you know, Burger King for lunch and a, and a steak and bake for dinner, then none of us would think it's weird. And so poor diet, lack of sunlight, lack of exercise, I've already become the bad kid. I already started to fulfill that prophecy as the bad kid and um, enter either liquid courage or chemical courage and boy, you had a recipe for disaster. So, you know, I don't want to bore you with the in-between, but I think what, what's relevant here is, so now you know a little bit of why I became an incredibly unhealthy homeless drug addict. Um, the darkest days took place at the end. You know, the darkest days took place um, being hospitalized multiple times, flatlining multiple times, um, in and out of jail. You know, county jail in Los Angeles is, is worse than most prisons across the country. And uh, living on Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles, down on San Julian, down by the Midnight Mission, um, to avoid turning your stomach inside out, um, I'll skip those stories, but trust me, they were dark. At some point, if you're interested, I put it all down in a book called I Forgot to Die. Um, and if you are interested in reading about that stuff, I didn't, I didn't write the book because uh, I wanted to entertain people. I wrote the book because I wanted to get my story out and get it out of my head because some of those dark days that you asked about um, were still really haunting me. You know, three, four, five years into my recovery, um, the nightmares, um, and uh, and just the general anxiety. Um, yeah, so ultimately, I wound up homeless. I wound up living on the streets. I wound up um, addicted to heroin, addicted to cocaine. That was kind of my go-to. Was what's called a speedball, where you put heroin and cocaine together and you inject it. That was my, uh, and that's why I still have all of these, you know, scars all over my arms from all the abscesses. That was my thing. Having said that, I would have I done anything. You know, I would <laughs> I would drink anything or take anything as long as I could not feel like me for a moment. But so I was, I was, I was an IV drug user. Um, I was homeless, completely homeless for the better part of a year and a half. Now, there were periods of homelessness before that, but I mean, I don't mean homeless like I was sleeping on someone's sofa or, you know, I didn't have an apartment. I was crashing my friend's house. I mean homeless, as in, you know, outdoors, nowhere to go, no one to turn to, homeless. Um, and uh, acute psychosis. I mean, if you don't sleep for days at a time and you're smoking crack and shooting heroin, you, you begin to imagine things and see things and, and, uh, and horrible, horrible things. So quite, quite mentally ill. Um, had always been depressed, you know, since, since I was a young child. And, um, and yeah, really unhealthy. And how did you start to overcome this depression and this addiction? I needed to find a, a God of my own understanding. Uh, a, as a child growing up, there was this kind of desperate wanting of a God to come in and, you know, maybe kill my father and, <laughs> and make, give my mom the lottery ticket or that won. Or, you know, there was this want. I wanted there to be a God. Um, but... Uh, you know, part of my story that I didn't mention, which I think I'm going to mention just because it's probably, it probably might help somebody, um, I'm, I'm the survivor of sexual abuse. Um, I had an older brother that was eight years older than me that I haven't seen since 1986, and um, I'm the survivor of sexual abuse. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a really, it was a horrible, confusing experience to go through what I went through as a child. Um, I don't blame him. I don't hold any grudges. I, I know that similar stuff was probably done to him. I hope he's out there doing great somewhere. Um, but uh, I, I went through that, and, and that's, that's part of the shame-based reality. That's part of the thing that drove me towards the addiction. That's part of the thing that made me feel dirty and alone and like I didn't belong anywhere. Because it's, it's very confusing as a child. I didn't get it. I didn't know what was going on. And that, by the way, you know, I don't know what the, the right word was, but it wasn't an isolated incident. It was something that happened to me, and then it was almost like I attracted that type of attention. Because was, there was numerous times that it happened. 
So I went through that, and that was really, really bad. And I survived that. And, uh, you know, as with your parents, you can kind of become your parents, or you can become the opposite of your parents. I think if you grow up in a violent household like I did, or if you grow up in a household where there's sexual abuse, you can either... Uh, is it continue the cycle, perpetuate the cycle? You can either continue, you know, you can either keep that going, or you can make a conscious decision to put an end to it. So, you know, you can imagine, as a child, I wanted God to exist, but how could God exist if if that type of stuff was happening to me? So there was no God for me. And as I got older, I became really, really jaded towards any type of religions, hated religions, and and hated the concept of God bottoming out and and winding up abstinent from drugs and alcohol i had to find some i had to find some water for my soul my soul was dry and it was brittle and i was dying on the inside um it wasn't just a physical thing it was a spiritual malady you know and i needed to find god um and uh yoga Yoga brought me, brought me towards God, and, um, and then I, you know, I traveled to India, um, I traveled to um, Indonesia, and uh, read a lot of books. I read almost every book on that shelf there, you know, from Kabbalah, Hinduism, Buddhism, everything. Spirituality was a, was, was a large part of it, and I had, to, I had to find God. I had to find some sort of a God that I could pray to and that I could believe in, and it, and it happened piecemeal. It did that. There was no white light experience. There was no burning bush that talked to me. There was me humbling myself to get on my knees and to at least allow the possibility that something other than myself existed. Now, fast forward to today, after my travels through India, my travels through Indonesia, my, my you know, put all of my experiences together, and there is an absolute knowing of a God, of my own understanding. And by my own understanding, I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know what a, I don't know if it's a man or a woman or a thing or, you know. I think the great irony would be if when we all died that there would be literally an old man with a beard sitting there. <laughs> you know, like, it's me, I'm God, <laughs> you know. Um, I don't know. I had, to, I had to find God. I had to remain absent, abs, abstinent from, uh, from drugs and alcohol. And... Um, and, and I had to start introducing superfoods and, and juices and nutrition into my, into my, uh, my vessel, my being. Food Heals Nation, if you are looking for the highest quality supplements, the most luscious organic skincare, and a brand name that you can trust to be free from toxic chemicals, look no further than the Global Healing Center. I have been using their products for years. Their Parfait Visage face lotion literally makes my skin look younger. And it comes in a beautiful bottle, so it is perfect as a gift as well. And the Oxy Powder Colon Cleanse Capsules are the most powerful detox supplements I have ever use they get everything out and they don't leave you feeling full or uncomfortable the mission of the global healing center is to bring back good health positive thinking happiness and love and they want to help you realize that your body is a self-healing mechanism well i couldn't agree more so i've teamed up with dr group and the global healing center to bring you a discount exclusive to food heals listeners go to their website at globalhealingcenter.com pick out the items you want and use the discount code FOODHEALS, all one word, for 20% off your purchase, plus free shipping to the U.S. and Canada. 20% off is a great deal, Food Heals Nation. I love their products, and I know you will too. You are listening to the Food Heals Podcast. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes. The reality is, yeah, grew up with immigrant parents, grew up with a lot of violence in the household, grew up uh, as a victim of sexual abuse, perpetuated that cycle of, of sexual abuse, you know, uh, many times over until I think it was about 10 and a half when it finally ended. Um, and I realized, like, wow, this is sick, this is wrong. Um, and I bottled it all up inside, and it wasn't until I was 19 years old. I was 19 years old. I'm sitting with a girl whose father had just died, and we're drunk, and I'm trying to console her, and there's just this really uncomfortable silence for about 20 minutes, and I finally just, out from my mouth comes, I was molested when I was a kid. And she's like, what? And we're sitting there smoking our camel lights, and I'm like, yeah, I was molested when I was a kid. And she's like, by who? And I'm like, 
by a few people. And I, I told my story for the first time to this girl whose dad had just died. And I remember driving home, you know, the next morning and like, I was molested. Like, I was molested. It seemed like there was a bad movie, a really bad, scary movie that had happened. And I saw it and it was there, but I didn't talk about the bad movie. But as I was driving home in that cold steel gray of dawn, uh, still probably mildly intoxicated, unfortunately, and smoking my, my cigarettes, you know, I was like, wow, I was, I was molested. Like, that's fucking terrible, you know? And um, the more I talked about it and the more, the more I came to grips with it, the more I wrote about it, uh, the less it had power over me. And after a while, truthfully, it is just a story. It is just what happened. Am I going to let it dictate who I am today or what I do today? No, man. It's some bad shit happened, but for God's sakes, it was like, you know, almost four decades ago. So back then, could you even imagine yourself as you are now, happy and healthy? I mean, I could never in a million years imagine, you know. I could never imagine doing this stuff. I could never imagine, you know, getting, getting up at the break of dawn and, and, and going down to the beach and taking my paddleboard out and paddle and gliding along the water and the dolphins coming up on this side. It's almost like, is this really happening? You know, and, and why it always happens when I'm alone, I don't know, because I always tell people about it and you want to take them out there and it never happens. But like to have those moments, the sun's coming up, the dolphins are coming up alongside of you. You're looking at them. They're looking at you. And you're having one of those moments where time stands still. Those are the moments that I hold inside my heart. And those are the moments that I never had. I spent 33 years on this planet consuming junk food, ingesting drugs, injecting drugs, smoking cigarettes, being depressed, being angry, being jealous, being the victim I almost missed all of life, you know? In, in 2001, up on Cuthbert, I flatlined, you know? I didn't take too much and throw up. I flatlined. I was dead. And the paramedics came, and it was a very eerie, you know, people always ask, like, did you see yourself? And yeah, you do. You see yourself. You're dead. Your body's on the ground, and you're floating up above, and you're dead, and you know it. There was no white light. There was no angels named Michael and Stephen that were escorting me off to some place that's better than this. I was dead. And thank God for those paramedics who, strangely enough, their station is right behind us here. You know, every time I drive by, it's like a little part of me remembers, you know. Thank God those paramedics came up there and used a defibrillator on me and brought me back to life because I almost missed the whole thing. I almost missed all of life. So essentially, you overcame your addiction through yoga, spirituality, and nutrition. And what did your doctor think about this? Did he think you should be on drugs? Did he think it was amazing? What did he say? I do know that I was told by uh, a psychiatrist that I'm actually still friends with today and my doctor, who's still my doctor today, that I absolutely positively had to be on antidepressants. I mean, there was no questions asked. I had to be on antidepressants. We went back and forth between Wellbutrin and Lexapro and some, Lexapro and some Trazodone at night. Um, I was told numerous times that I needed to be on those medications. And I love these guys. I love these doctors. But the truth is, is that for over nine years now, I have not taken any Lexapro. I've not taken any Wellbutrin. I don't take anything. I think, you know, Tylenol PM is about as risque as I'll get. So, you know, the doctor said I had to be on antidepressants. I had to be on psych medications. And it just isn't true. And what about nutrition? Nutrition is the key not only to good health, but to alleviating symptoms of depression, um, lifting yourself up out of your, your creaky old state, and, uh, and, and to feeling amazing. Okay, final words. What advice would you like to leave everyone with? Never stop. Never stop trying. If you fall down, get up. That's part of life. But never lose sight of the goal. And the goal is to have a happy, productive, fulfilling life that has meaning. And you can't do that sitting around eating junk food, you know, and eating cheeseburgers and smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee all day. Like Hippocrates said, let your food be your medicine and let your medicine be your food.
All right, Food Heals Nation, that's our show. Thanks for listening. For all the show notes from this episode, go to foodhealsnation.com slash 22. Today's tweetable comes from Khalil. Never stop trying. If you fall down, get up. Never lose sight of the goal to have a happy, productive, fulfilling life. If you like that, tweet it to Khalil at Sun Life Organics. Tweet it to us at Food Heals Nation and make sure to use the hashtag Food Heals Podcast. If you're in LA and you want to check out Khalil's Juice Bar, there are four locations. You can go to sunlifeorganics.com to find out where they are. And Khalil is also the owner of Malibu Beach Yoga, and you can look that up at malibubeachyoga.com. We've still got the swag bag contest going on. We have a few gift bags left, so you know how to enter. Leave us a raving review on iTunes or on Stitcher and screenshot your review and send it to us. You can email it to us at info at foodhealsnation.com or you can tweet it to us. We're at Food Heals Nation or you can post it to our Food Heals Nation Facebook wall and you'll be automatically entered to win a swag bag full of our favorite organic health and beauty products valued at over $300. And today I just want to leave you with another quote that Khalil said, and he was actually quoting Hippocrates, the father of medicine. Let thy food be thy medicine, and let thy medicine be thy food. See you next time, Food Heals Nation. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, developing a more positive outlook on life. In rare cases, women have experienced a strong desire to stop asking their boyfriends if they look fat in this dress. If you experience any of these symptoms, post a selfie to Instagram immediately.